Today I'm going to continue from Friday and going to continue on the virtual memory topic. Uh, first of all, for the announcement, and this thing doesn't work. Clicker. Uh, for the announcement, lab two grades and feedback should be available tonight by midnight, as well as homework number two. And um, lab three is due this Friday. How how's the lab going? Uh, I hope most people at least look at the handout and have a rough idea on how to work on them. Uh, how many of you haven't really started the lab? Okay. It's okay. It is doable in a few days. It might be a little tough. And make sure you have a good test case. But with the feedback from lab two, you should have a rough idea on how your lab to starter code performs against the, the test, uh, all the test bench, and you can correct all the mistakes that you did on, say, CPSR and some of the corner cases. Midterm one would be in two weeks, and what I believe the talk we would cover up until SIMD and vector instruction, which is the last question in homework three. So for this particular homework, it will actually cover the topic that will be taught, I believe, right before the, the homework is due, which is the lab, the, pretty much the last question, but I included that so that you can work on that before the midterm exam, just in case those questions exist in the midterm, you won't get too surprised on how to solve the, uh, the problem. Uh, and again, I'm going to announce this again. T uh, this week during recitation, maybe about half an hour or one hour, uh, for like the, the earlier section of the every recitation, we're going to go over the paper summary of the, on all the required reading. And would you like me to also summarize the, the other reading that I mentioned in the lecture? OK, I'll, I'll do that. <coughs> I'll prioritize the, the required one and then put the rest like after those things. That should be roughly one or one and a half hours. This in case we have planned to work on other things during the, the latter section of the, the lab. In case you have questions on the lab three or homework. All right. And um, last week I covered some topic about uh, problem with page table and also okay here also how to do the address translation and problem number one that I covered last time is what if the page table getting too large say one megabyte entries and each entry is four bytes then the size of the page table can become as big as four megabyte that's pretty much the out most of, in a lot of systems can be your entire L2 cache. And this can get really, really expensive, especially back in the 80s, where that is pretty much your entire uh, memory, the physical memory that you have. Anything more than that, you have to grab it from the disk. And the lengthy over that is really, really long compared to grabbing something from the DRAM. <coughs> and the solution to this is to have a multi-level page table uh, I I'll sh I can go to some practice problem problem at toward the end of the class about how to solve the multi-level page table, but essentially it's almost the same how you solve the uh, single level, but you have more in mean directions. You look at where the actual page, the table for the page table is, and then you actual uh, look up where the page is located in the physical memory. And the second problem is, what if your page table is located in memory, not in the cache? So what would happen in the case before every memory access, you have to fetch the page table entry, but because they are in the memory, which, is, which has high latency compared to the cache, you have to go to memory to get your page table entry, and you have to go to memory again in order to get the page. That can have a large performance effects on your uh, system performance. So one solution is to use a uh, structure called tra uh, translation leukocyte buffer or TLB, and what TLB is is just a it's a hardware structure where page table entries, just the entries, not the whole table, are being cached. And because 
some page, some, some particular page server ent entries are being used more often than the others because they have locality. Uh, they can be stored in the cache or the faster access chunk of your systems. <clears throat> and whenever a, a virtual address needs to be translated, the w the first thing that we do is to go refer to this trans uh, TLB table and search that table whether the particular virtual address exists in the cache uh, in in this TLB or not. If it is, then you can just get the page directory page table entries from the TLB instead of going to the page table and walk the whole page table. And for example, in uh, Intel 8386, there are 32 entries in the TLB. And as you can imagine, 32 is really small. But then this allows you to be able to save a lot of memory bandwidth because that's actually enough during that time to store most of the frequently used page table entries. <clears throat> and what what does what data you have to store in the TLB? Usually, in most cases, you you have to store the tag, which is the indexes that you have to use to search whether it's a hit or miss, and then the actual data, which in this case is the page table entries or the PTE, and the tag. In most cases, they, you can just store the twenty bits VPN, and then uh, the valid flag. And all the all the flags that contain that are contained in the page table entry, so that I can look up whether it's valid or invalid easier and faster, and decide whether it's a correct uh, access right information or not when you access some uh, a virtual memory. And once you have the tag, you have to encode the data along with the the, the tag, which is the actual PC, uh, page table entries, and. <coughs> What if you have context switch? In this case, what, what can happen? Uh, can anyone give an example? What are some bad things that can happen? Yeah. So all of the entries in the TLB are invalid? Yes. So when you have context switch, what would happen in the TLB is all the entries becomes invalid. Why? Because say, assume that you have a processor X that is running right now, and it maps uh, VPN5 to the uh, PPN 100. In this case, the you allocate an entry in a TLB that has a tag which has to contain the value of five, and then the data in that particular entry will contain the value of 100, which is a PPN. <coughs> now let's assume that the the process switch to to run process Y, and process Y also has a uh, uh, some has to operate on the virtual address that has VPN5. But in this case, the actual data is located in physical uh, page number 200 instead of 100. When process one wants to access this particular address, it search in the TLB. What happened in the, in the TLB right now, it contains the index number 5, but the PPN that's in there is 100. It's not actually a TLB hit because the PPN value is still 100. So you fetch from the wrong location in your memory. So one way to solve this is to, you can flush the TLB. And whenever there's a context switch, you invalidate all the entries in your TLB. And this is done in the processor in the old day, for example, the Intel AG, uh, H36 which is around the 80s. Uh, this update the value of CR3, which actually signal the context switch. Uh, as you recall, the CR3 is the base address that you use to look up the page directory, the, the earliest level of the interaction when you look up the virtual, uh, when you translate the virtual address to the physical address. And this ultimately triggers the TLB flutch. Another solution which are less costly is you can associate TLB entry with processes. You just add an extra few in your <coughs> TLB entries and use that tag to identify which process where that does the data in this particular entry belongs. So 
when you have a context switch from processor X to processor Y, but has the same VPN number, you look into this data and you see that, oh, the ownership of this particular entries is from process X, not me, not process Y. Then you know that, oh, I probably will have to uh, invalidate this entry because it, it belongs to the all process, not the entire TLB entries, the whole table. And this is done in the modern x86 processor as well as the uh, MIPS processor. <coughs> and what if you have a TLB mess? Because TLB is small, usually to in the order of hundreds, you can you can it cannot hold all the page table entries. And some somehow you want to access some data in memory, it's gonna mess in TLB. What what would what would happen in this case? Uh, can anyone explain what can happen? Yeah. So you have to go through the page table. Yeah, pretty much you have to do the whole process of address translation, walk the page table, which uh, has a long latency compared to the just look up the data in the TLB because in TLB it stays in the cache. Walking the page table can incur something along the memory latency, which is order of magnitude longer than accessing the cache. <clears throat> and who, who actually handles this TLB misses? There can be two solutions, which is a hardware-managed TLB and a software-managed TLB. And prost, like, modern processor actually employs different uh, scheme to handle TLB misses. Some of them use a hardware-managed TLB. Some of them use a software-managed TLB. Uh, one example of the processor that uses a hardware managed TLB is x86, the Intel processor that we commonly use in most, of, pretty much all of this, the laptops you guys are using. The hardware does the page walk. Whenever there's a TLB mess, you uh, refer to MNU, MNU perform the page walk. Hardware fetch the page table entry and insert that entries into the TLB. And if the TLB is full, Hardware also has to decide which entries within the TLB you want to evict. And most of the case, what you want to do is you would like to evict entries that you predict will be the least recently used or will be less likely to be reused again. And that, that policy is being referred to as LYU. And we'll, re uh, we'll go back to that particular policy again when we talk about caching. And this, all of this is done transparently, so the software has, doesn't have to manage anything here. Whenever there's a page, uh, TLB misses, hardware manages all of them. <coughs> In a map processor, you can, it, they actually use the software managed cache. So what happens when we have a TLB miss? Hardware assert exception. And the OS knows about the exception, so it does the page walk, it fetch the page table entries, and then insert the evicted entries, and insert the new entry into the TLB, evict the entry it wants to evict back uh, <coughs> so that once you have to access that particular entry that's being evict, you have to get grab them from the page table. And what can be the, the downside of this approach in a software managed uh, versus a hardware managed TLB? It's probably slower. Yes, because when you when you raise an exception, what what happened? You went over this in yeah, the yes, and also you have to flush the pipeline. Yeah. So in this case, you have to flush the pipeline, and that can be that can incur a performance penalty. So let me let me continue on to uh, the how how do you handle TLB miss using hardware managed TLB. The benefit is you have no exception. Instruction, every, everything just stall. And <clears throat> any in instruction that are independent to this particular TLB misses, you can continue <laughs> execution. That means if you have independent instruction, you don't have to stall the pipeline. This incurs small footprint, but <clears throat> uh, the page directory or page table organization is etched in stone. You don't have the ability as a software or OS designer to so, uh, 
redefine how you would like to manage or remanage the TLB, it's always the hardware that manages it. If you want to solve and manage TLB, the benefit is OS can design its own way to manage the page directory or page table. And you can use a more advanced TLB replacement policy where there are actually many research done on how you would like to replace the TLB entries that would be benef most beneficial for your uh, systems or some particular workload that you would like to run on your systems. However, whenever you have a TLB miss, in this case, you have to flush the pipeline and that ensure a bigger performance overhead. <clears throat> and now I, I went over how you can uh, f make the process of looking up the or translating virtual address to physical address faster using TLB. Anyone have any pro uh, questions with uh, relating to TLB or address translation in virtual memory? No. Yes. Everyone is so silent. <laughs> Did you? I'm pretty sure you went over this in 213, am I correct? Okay. All right, the next topic is how you can provide protection in uh, with, with virtual memory. Because when you're using a system, you are using, usually most of the time you use that as a normal user. But then there's also a supervisor user that has the full control of the systems. <coughs> And in theory, a normal user process should not be able to read or write into another process memory. Say you have different users locking into your, uh, on your systems. User number one should not be able to access whatever data user number two is processing on in the memory because they, he can actually store some password or process some password or some uh, important information that he would want to make sure it doesn't get exposed to anyone else in the systems. Or what if you want to write in a shared library data? How can you perf uh, perform making sure you uh, protect everyone else? Because this data is being shared by every user in the systems. And how does virtual memory can help in this case is first it can provide the address space isolation because as we recall from last lecture, every process has its own view of a linear virtual address space. And then virtual memory provides an uh, indirection that translates the virtual address space to wherever the location is in, in the physical address. So you have this address space isolation <laughs> that you can protect information from uh, in, in the page table from the other user. <coughs> and this also provides efficient clearing of data in the newly allocated pages. And um, can you guys give me one example of what could have gone wrong without protection? Saying you have virtual memory, but you have no protection. And you have the multiple processes running. You have, and there's one process that would like to get, say, a password that are uh, being processed or stored in the other process uh, memory location. Any example? Use case, Secur security breach. All right, uh, one example that can happen here is you have process A that write my password is something into the virtual address 2. What would happen in the OS? It maps this virtual address 2 to some physical page, say number 4 in the page table. <coughs> and then, oh, a process is like, oh, I'm done with this particular data. I'm going to free this, this space. So. Process A no longer needs virtual address to it free the, the that block of memory. OS unmap virtual address number two from physical page number four in the page table. If there's no protection, what can happen is you have you can have another process B that continually allocate pages, trying to allocate as many pages as it can and search for the string my password equals something in the entire uh, memory space because once processes free them, when you allocate that the, the, the new uh, page in the other process, you can luckily get that particular page and get that data inside the page. So you can actually try to read that password. 
if you don't have the protection. <coughs> <coughs> and ideally, what you want to do is no, not every process is allowed to ask access every other pro, uh, every pages. So you may need a super, supervisor level privilege, uh, privilege to access the system pages. That's one example. So the idea is to store access control information on a page basis in the process page table. So every, every page, every entry is in your page table entries, you store the access control information. And you enforce this access control uh, at the same time as translation. So once you try to translate physical address to the uh, virtual address to the physical address, you, the system knows whether you can actually access this page or not. And <coughs> nowadays, the modern system for virtual memory serves two functions. First, it provides address, address translation <coughs> for the illusion of having infinite memory. And you also provide access control, which protects uh, one page processes from the other processor that would like to access the data or uh, try to breach the security. Uh, as you can see, what you want to do in this case, you want to have a per process page table. So each process has its own virtual address space. For example, in here you have process one and two. You can have virtual address 1, VP1, VP2, up to, say, VPM. And over here, you have VP1, V 2 up to VPK. Uh, virtual memory provides address translation from virtual page 1 to, say, physical page 2 in the DRAM, in the physical address space. And then this particular process also has uh, allocate some pages, and it translate to different pages in a physical space. One scenario that can happen is, what if you have two processes that are sharing the same page? This, for well, example, can be a read-only library code that both of them have to access in order to run some other application within the process. <coughs> uh, in this case, virtual memory has to provide access control for both process one and process two on all of these pages. And also have to make sure that both processes uh, just try to read into this particular chunk of memory, not write anything to them, because they are read only. So what information do you need uh, in the page table entries in order to ensure uh, access control? For each of the processes, you want to make sure that for every virtual address, virtual page that you allocate to, you have to access control whether you can read or write to that physical address. And what actually is a physical address? So this physical address entries refer links to the location in your memory. And this provides access control whether you can read or write into or read from that particular page in the memory. And if this is violated, if this particular control is violated, the system generates exception. And then it uh, uses the page form handler <coughs> to check before remapping whether you want to generate exception or not. And here's one example in SSX on how they allocate different levels for protection. You have three levels. You have application level, OS level, system kernel, uh, operating system kernel that are the core of all the protection rings. And if you're just a typical application running on in a user mode, you are running in level number three. So in this case, you cannot access any page that are being allocated for level that are below, which is level two, level one, level zero in this case. <clears throat> and here's another breakdown on the diagram earlier. Ring number two is the, the one that has the highest privilege that can access anything, any level that goes beyond this level, which is level one, two, and three. 
Wing number one is actually, actually is not widely used because they are actually OS related uh, level, but they commonly actually just use ring number zero for the highest privilege. And the, the, the least privilege one is the user application level where you define, or uh, you, you, when you run an application, you want to use some data in the memory or you want to write some data into the memory you have the privilege as ring number three, and you cannot add access any information that are being allocated to the OS, which uh, in different previous, uh, previous level. <coughs> <coughs> and the, the current previous level or CPL is determined by the address of the instruction that you are executing. Specifically, you are, it's actually the defined by the descriptor period level of the code segment. So different code segment will have different DPL, which will define the current period level, which define whether you can access a particular page or not based on the period level. And if you take a closer look at the page table entries and the page directory entries, this is another entry that links to the page table, it actually contains the information that you have to use for access control, which is this particular bit. So if you look at, for example, the page directory entry, you have to address on the page table from bit 12 to bit 31, but then you have extra data because the, the address space is 32 bits long. You have some ignore bits, and then the rest you have some access control bits. So this is the address of the page table. That's the flags that you have to uh, <coughs> comply when you want to access some virtual addresses. Same here in the <coughs> page table entries. You have the address of the four kilobytes page frame. So this is the address of the page table, which is a larger chunk of memory. This is a four kilobyte of page frame. You also have the flags that uh, specify what are the control level or uh, access level required in order to grab or use the data. And here is the protection bit. Here is the description of these bits in the page directory entries. And the page directory entry actually protects all the pages within its entry. So. In XSX systems, that means it protects 1,024 pages. And if you multiply the number, that's four megabytes of data. Because each page is, uh, if I recall, is four kilobytes page frame. And you have tw uh, 1020 of them, so that's four megabytes. <coughs> you have the present bit, which is, if it's zero, it's, it doesn't present, it's not valid. You have a read or write protection, a user supervisor prote uh, protection. These are more like, these are more caching related. It's a page level write through or a page level cache dis disable. So you, you will learn more how this might have affect system performance in when, when we do caching. <coughs> and you have a ignore bit and access bit, which indicate whether this entry has been used for linear address translation. In this, for this particular lecture, when you want to provide access control, you look into these two bits, whether you can read or write, or whether you, are, you want only the supervisor to, to use it, or it's a user, user mode accesses. Similarly, in the page table entry, which now protect only one page, four kilobytes at a time, you have the same, almost the same set of bits. And if you focus on the, the access control bit, which is bit position one and two, they have the same set of bits, the read and write bit, as well as the user supervisor bits. And if you combine all of them into one bigger table, saying whether you are a user or supervisor, is it read only or write only? I mean, read only or read or write in the, in the next column. And you break down that into a page table, page entry, page table entries and the actual combined effect when you look when you try to access a page 
and you have different combination of these uh, access type and privilege bits. One example is what if you are the user that want to that has to access type read only in the that that's the, the bits in the page directory entry are set in that in, in that way. And the, also in the page table is the previous user access type read only. If you combine the effects in this case, yeah. Oh, sorry. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. In this case, the combined effect is a user can have to access have a read only for this particular page. Uh, <clears throat> what if you are in, in, in the page directory entries, it's a read only for a user? In the page table, it's a read or write. In this case, the combined effect is actually read only. So the combined effects, you can think of this as, as an and of the two uh, access type. Because if you could, as you can see here, if you set the read-only bits at any location, this particular entry becomes read-only. And if you want to make sure this particular page is read and writable, you have to set the bits into read, and read, read or writable in both locations. Slide. What's the point of uh, supervisor read only? Supervisor read only? Like, why, why is there anything that you would not want the supervisor mode to be able to write to? I mean, I can imagine like some code segments might you might not want to change them. In yeah, I think maybe like static code segment that would you would like to make sure it's read only data. You probably don't want anyone to access them because somehow you you access your machine as a supervisor anyway, and say you sudo or something, and you accidentally change that particular data, and it can be harmful to you. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking like kernel modules. Yep. Yes. So yeah, kernel module can be one example of that. You probably don't want to change them even though you, you're the supervisor, because that can actually, say, crash your systems. <coughs> All right. So another way you can provide protection is called segmentation. <clears throat> In, if you use paging, which is earlier example, you have read or write flags. You can use the supervisor flags. And you can also have an executable flags, whether you can execute that uh, anything within that particular memory block or not. So you you will have another, you will also have another separate techniques called segmentation that also provide protection, <coughs> and you also have the almost similar flags which should read or write or the disk and also the descriptive privilege level, which specify the privilege level of that particular segment in the memory, and whether it's executable or not. And when you combine the page. Uh, and segmentation flags in XSIC manual, for example, it specify which uh, which take over which. For example, in this case, the parser evaluate the segmentation protection uh, segment protection first, which is this particular case, and then evaluate the page protection later. <coughs> and if the memory access is not carried out, which means it violates one of these protection exception is generated. And that's commonly done in modern processor, including x86. So as I said, aside from just using the virtual memory, memory you can also use segmentation. Uh, there's another earlier technique called base amount register, which I would not cover in this particular uh, lecture, but I'll cover segmentation. And none of None of the might none of these might not be as elegant as page uh, page based access control, which I described earlier. And for the, say for example, six four bits uh, accessing machines, they still have segmentation pr uh, support, but they define the base and bound to be the whole mem entire memory space. I, 
instead of a uh, 32 bit version where you still have segmentation to support the older forms of codes. And here's the overview of segmentation. Given you have the physical memory from address, uh, address 0 to, say, 06 FFFF, <coughs> you divide the physical address space into segments. And the segment can overlap. So you can have the best register up to this particular 0x7 FFF to be one segment, and then the rest 0x8000 to FFFF to, into another segment. And when you have a virtual address and you would like to access a location in the physical memory, and this little address, virtual address, belongs to, say, this segment. When you calculate the location of the physical memory you would like to access, you add this to the base address, and you get the physical address. And you, then you know which particular location in that particular segment, in, in the entire, entire physical memory you would like to access. And this is the common technique that are used in the older parser, for example, Intel 8086 in the late 70s, which has 16-bit processor. <coughs> and for this particular processor, it has four segment register that store the base address. So these are the four segments, which is the code segment, data segment, stack segment, and the extra segment. And this is not generic to any processor, so you can actually define in, in other processor design, when you design another processor, you can divide this to many segments. And in this example, in actually in Intel 8086, you can also subdivide these segments into multiple subsegments. But uh, only four of them are addressable at once at any given time. So suppose you have these multiple layers of segments inside your memory. At any given time, you can only uh, access four of them because you, you only have four segment register. <coughs> and the programmer, it's, it's a programmer's job to set the segment register value. Uh, for example, right now the code segment refers to value E, even though you have multiple code segments, say D, C, and D, E, and G, once the s value are for the code segment is set, this is the location in the physical memory that it's, it's referring to, and you can only access this particular chunk of memory, even though you have D, E, and G as well, and you have to reset that particular value E into something else, say D, if you want to access anything within this uh, region. And each segment is uh, 64 kilobyte in size because it's the 8086 processor is 16 bits. So this is more like a processor uh, limitation that you have because it's only 16 bits. <coughs> and <coughs> how, well, because if you look at this, the entire memory space in doing those error, say what if it's one megabyte, how can AD86 processor actually access up to one megabyte of data? So a trick you can do is you can have a segment register with the offset, where you have, when you have the virtual address, which is, say, 0, 0, 2, 2, you add that to a segment register with another value you, you have to set on, uh, that refer to some location in the entire memory space. And you translate that, you shift the segment register by four bits, you add this virtual address bit, into the shifted segment register to get the 20-bit version that can access the entire memory. So first of all, you have to set the segment register value in order to uh, specify the bit, 
to some degree the base address within the each block, and uh, then you have the virtual address, which specify what location within within that particular block that you would like to access from for each of the virtual address. <coughs> so the question is for for a memory access, how does the machine know which of the four register to use? Any idea? So that actually depends on the type of memory access because each region has a name. For example, this, uh, there's a core segment, data segment. If the type of memory access to the code segment, then <coughs> it's so say what if you have an instruction fetch, you probably have the default segment to be the code segment. And then say if, if it's a variable inside your program, the default segment can be the data segment, but then you have the alternate segment base, which are the core segment uh, and also special segment and uh, the stack. <coughs> and this one example is done in AD86 Proster. And this can also be overwrite. For example, if you have this sort of instruction, uh, you can add the instruction pref uh, prefixes to overwrite the default core segment base <coughs> to specify for example here you want to use this particular segment as a base register and add to the address instead of the default segment. In the early 80s, which is more modern compared to 8086, the Intel 8286 still has a 16-bit processor, still have four, uh, four segment register, but this segment register stores the index into the table of base address, not the base address itself. So now you have the segment register that has four value, 16 bits. And then you have the segment descri descriptor table, which is actually 64 bits. And each one of these entries in the segment selector can refer to any one of these entries from 0 to n minus 1, depending on how you, how you define <coughs> how many entries the, of the segment descriptor that you want, depending on your uh, memory address, the size of your memory, physical memory. And here's one example. You have a segment descriptor that describes as a segment. And this is a 16-bit uh, base address over here. And this is limit, which is the size of the segment, which is also a 16-bit uh, value. And this, you also have the descriptor previous level, which specify the level of access control that you would like for the, the particular segment descriptor, the particular segment or page to some degree. I mean, you can think of a segment as a page, so it's a block of data that you would like to control in order to control the access or whether you can actually access that particular page or not, or, or segment or not. And you also have another uh, bit. <coughs> So what can be the issue of uh, segmentation? Anyone has thoughts on that? Yeah? I mean, they're generally like fixed size, at least. Uh, right. So you can think of it this way. Segmentation uh, can actually create segmentation problem. If you def uh, declare a lot of segments that you want to use, and then you unallocate them, you can have a bunch of uh, holes within the physical memory where you have allocated data, unallocated data. And if those unallocated data doesn't form a, a contiguous region of sufficient size, say you want to ask, you want to do a, a malloc of four megabytes of data, but then you don't have to read, you, you have enough space if you sum up all the allocated region, but you do not have this, this uh, 
continuous 4 megabyte chunk of data. Now, in this case, you cannot get the 4 megabyte uh, size of uh, data you can operate on. I mean, size of memory that you can operate on. So in this case, it runs into a segmentation problem. <coughs> and the page-based virtual memory, or uh, virtual memory in general, solves this issue by ensuring that address space is divided into a fixed size page. And then virtual address space manage the rest. It manage this it lost, uh, 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 assumption that you have uh, unlimited amount of memory. And it's, it's a linear space, uh, contiguous, linear contiguous space, and it provides an indirection to the actual physical address. All right, I'm going to take a break here. Uh, let's say five minutes, and I'll come back after the break. All the virtual mem memory plus access control to nowadays. In the modern x86 machines, for a 32-bit version of x86, it still actually uses the segmentation similar to 82 86 that I just explained it, uh, the, the last one I explained. But the 64-bit version segmentation is not supported per se. What, it, what I mean by that is it forces the base address to be address zero, forces the limit to be the entire memory space, F, 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 F. But you still support DPL to support backward compatibility. And on a side note for the Linux and 32-bit x86, Linux doesn't really support segmentation as well on a 32-bit machine. So for all segments, Linux set, set the base to zero, set the limit to FFFFFFF, similarly to the 64-bit x86. And inside Linux use uh, segments for previous level, similarly to the 64-bit version as well. <coughs> and for any segment that used by the kernel, Linux sets the DPL bit to zero. And for any segment that are used by application, they set the DPL to three. And um, what are other issues uh, with, say, address translation, virtual memory in general? Uh, one, one of the question is, when do we do the address translation? Should we do, do this before accident L1 cache, which is the fastest uh, memory, per se, after the register file? Or should we do this afterward? What a trade-off. Is the castle, in other words, let me rephrase the same question. In other words, is, ca is the cache virtually address or physically address? There's a trade-off between virtual versus physical cache. And you will learn all these techniques and trade-off in 740. So this is not covered in this class. And what are the issues that can happen with a virtually address cache? You can have synonym problem, which means that you have two virtual address, but it maps to the same physical address. <coughs> Which means you can have inconsistency in data. Also, you can have a physical address that can be present in multi uh, multiple locations in the cache, which also causes inconsistency in data. And you have to deal with that. And you go over this inconsistency in the data within the cache in the later lecture when we go over the caching. And there'll be actually there'll be a lab that you have to deal with this inconsistency and making sure all the shared data, uh, shared data are consistent across all the processes. All right, so that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, let me give you one sample problem of multi-level page table entries. And the problem actually, I, I borrowed that from 213 exam again. Thank you, 213, for making this exam for you guys. So this is the address with it con its content. And the description, I believe it's up here. So you have, uh, for the 32-bit address, bits 
22-231 is the directory. And this is table. And it's the offset. And that's bit 11. And this is 12. Given that this uh, uh, C, the PDBR are raised value CR3. So let me go over this table real quick. So the base address for the page directory is this value. And virtual address is this. Get me the physical address. And once you got me the physical address, I'll let you go. <clears throat> or you can work as a group, like the whole room as a group too, if that's easier. I'm thinking, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Everyone is like staring. <laughs> and let, let me let me also like change all the bits to uh, binary. So I have zero eight zero zero one six a b a. So a is ten. That's zero one zero. And that's zero 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 one. So that's your virtual address. Here is the first 12 bits. And here is your 10 bits, and this is the rest. Of the 10 bits. Really? Well, so if you go to the page directory yes. address yes. that is mapped from this um, the base address, address mm -hmm. then the contents are not uh, an address that we're using. Actually, I think you can. Because, I mean... Unless I'm looking at the wrong page table, or yeah. page directory entry. It's E zero two zero. Yeah. Where? That brings you to zero one two eight eight, which is not... Oh, you're, you're talking about this entry? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's the entry you want to look at, though. <laughs> it's a different entry. So let me give you an actually this entry and you can figure out why. The zero A zero, the shifted by two bits version. It, you, you know why? Yeah, so so it's actually that that 
this entry, not this. So you have to shift, because this full byte is aligned, you shift everything by two bits. So you can say, well, you can, I guess, expand or uh, get more data out of your 10 bits over here. Well, it makes sense, because every entry <coughs> in your table is going to be four bytes yeah. anyway. Yeah. So. All right, so given it's that public entry and the content is that you're almost there. Get, get me the next level of indirection. What's the page tail entry? So my, my intuition is to take the, uh, the that content yeah. and use that as an address and add the table mm -hmm. offset to mm -hmm. our virtual address. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's also does not have to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me let me check the actual virtual address. Maybe I got it, I copied it wrong. Zero 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 eight zero zero one six B A. So that 12 bits, you have value of one over here. Okay. And let me go over to oh. that diagram. Yeah. Uh, when you wrote it. No. Let me let me actually align this so that you have two of them at the same time. No, I think when you. Oh, Oops. there's a one. I was confused when looking at the board. I thought it was zero, but there's actually a one. Yeah, that's a one at the end. Oh, too far. All right. And that should be a separate. No, it's a. Oh, life is hard. Whoa, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I've managed to completely purge windows from my life. It's wonderful. Um, OK, that's the address. And here's the diagram. And that's the tiny one over here. It's a value of one. So first of all, look look at this. And then look at what you want to add over there. And then look at this table on where it match. <laughs> because if you look at the past directory entries, it's not everything you want to get used in order to get the data. It's the only last uh, from bits number 12 to bits 31. The rest, the rest are access control, which are also important because you have to check whether you can actually access the data or not. So then it's the 55004? Five, yes, yes it is. It's this because first you add one to that, well it's one shifted two bits. So it, 
0055004. It the content is that. Now get me the content. This should be a lot simpler. Well, I mean, using the same process with the offset at this. Okay, here. The, the actual physical address you want to access. From this, well, what you do is you combine this with this bit, and you get the physical address. You just whatever in that entry, uh, 8974D, and then 6VA, the 100 bits, because the page offset will always carry over from the virtual address to the physical address. And then, in this particular case, the entry is the, the last 12 bits is 003, which means you have 1, 1 over here. <coughs> the read and write bit set to 1, and the page is valid because the P is present. It's 1. So it's, there's no page fault. You can actually uh, access that, that particular vir uh, virtual address. And the physical address is that appended to this. All right, clear. Uh, I hope you guys can work through this. In the actual problem, it might be a, in, in the exam, it might be a little harder than this, as in we might ask more of this, like what are the access control, or what if you can do tricks. For example, one of the questions in your homework is what's your size of your physical memory, if I recall correctly, from the virtual memory question. It's a totally different way to think of the virtual memory problem. But take a look at that and try it out. If you have any question regarding how to solve that particular problem in the homework, come talk to us. And uh, we'll guide you without giving the answer. All right, and that concludes the lecture today. Yeah, sure. Uh, so operating systems. Yeah have some level of ability <coughs> to mess around with virtual memory. Uh, can, you, can you define mess around? Um, not really. That's mostly my question. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so like, I, I, I've seen instances where um, the operating system at least has the ability to be aware of uh, when maybe a user program mm -hmm. is um, you know, missing in the cache or right. um, or uh, if it's missing in the page table, or uh, I don't know if the operating system has the ability to modify the page table um, or actually um, do its own mapping to physical memory. Uh, address, address mapping is possible. Uh, so you can also do something like page curling, for example, to, okay. to map different addresses to different location in say memory banks right. so you you interleave memory or you can make you oh you can be a bad OS but where you map everything to one say memory channel right. probably you don't want to do that you want to like separate them right so are we going to talk about like any of the operating system tools or a s oh I I can talk about that during the session that? Okay. I I don't think we're gonna go go over this in the class but you have if you would like me to go over that in class during the recitation, I can definitely do that. Maybe, maybe like in after the midterm, because I was thinking saving this particular lab section for going over the paper. The next week would be if you have any question regarding the midterm, and afterward, uh huh? The paper. The paper. I think you said. Yeah, this week I will go over the required readings and oh, yes. and. Uh, papers that are mentioned in the lecture. So okay. I thought I, you meant like we're writing a paper. No, <laughs> like no. You you guys are not writing the paper. Okay. Uh you, if you would like to write a paper, <laughs> also that's fine. Negotiate with owner. <laughs> I have no control over that. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you can if you have a good like, great idea that you want to work on, maybe you can you can talk with him. Cool. Right? Uh, that, that's all. Uh, that concludes the lecture. If anyone has questions regarding the lab,
feel free to contact me or the other TA is also the homework which will which are uh, available and we'll do next week on Wednesday.